Um, so good morning or afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the webinar and panel on best practices for post hole installation. I am Casey Adderhold speaking from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology headquarters in Washington, DC. Of course, remote right now, so in my apartment. Um, IRIS is a consortium of universities and an NSF funded science facility operating programs that enable earth scientists to perform advanced research in geophys geophysics, particularly in seismology. This webinar will be recorded and archived on the IRIS Earthquake Science Presentations YouTube channel. Should you have a comment or question as the webinar unfolds, um, then please clearly and concisely type it into the Q&A box, not the chat box on your Zoom control panel. At the end, I will read your name and question to the presenters. If similar questions have been asked, I may combine or skip them. If the webinar meeting happens to crash due to Zoom or internet issues, I will reboot it and just click the webinar meeting link again. So I just want to get started with um, just a little intro to the, to the project. Um, emplacement of seismometers in post holes has progressed greatly in the last decade through the availability of purpose-built sensors and through a wide exploration of techniques by seismic network operators and principal investigators. Right now, we've got um, a whole group of people with a lot of experience um, to discuss post hole emplacement and what they've learned through their experiences. And so I'm just going to go ahead and pass this to Emily now. Um, Dr. Emily Wollen is the Seismic Network Manager at Albuquerque Seismo Lab at USGS. She directs the operations of over 300 seismic stations in global and US networks including data distribution, management of maintenance and operations, and advises the scientists in charge on the planning, coordination, and direction of those networks. So Emily, do you want to go ahead and take it away? For the intro, Casey, um, and I'm super excited to be co-organizing this, um, this series of discussions on post hole emplacements. So today, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, why I'm interested in uh, post hole emplacements and things like that. Um, and then we'll turn it over to our amazing panelists um, so that we can hear from them. Um, but I, I just wanted to, um, this is this is the very first webinar in what Casey and I anticipate will be a series of discussions on uh, post hole emplacements and looking at the, the technical details of drilling a hole and the seismological results that result from improved data quality and things like that. Um, so I have the the great pleasure of kicking this off um, this morning. So let's get to it. So uh, I, I first want to go over what, what we hope to achieve with this. So this is going to be a series of discussions, right? So this is only, only the first. So if you are a post hole enthusiast and you haven't gotten a chance to chime in yet, don't worry, there will be more coming. Um, but the mission of this series of discussions is to pull together the expertise of our community so that we can learn from combined previous experiences and recommendations so that we can ensure that future post hole emplacements will be of the highest quality possible and so that we can all outline areas that still need to be explored and developed. So Casey and I are organizing this webinar series not because we are experts in post hole installation. That's certainly not the case, at least on my part, um, but we have recognized that deep pockets of, ex of expertise on this topic exist in many places in the seismology community, but we don't often have an opportunity to talk to each other about that and to get ideas and knowledge out of heads and onto pages so that other people can discover it and use it to make decisions in their own uh, seismological fieldwork and installations. So that's the goal of this series is to get us all talking to each other um, to get all of that information into a format that is discoverable, accessible, and actionable. So our goals are to summarize um, the history, motivations, and development of seismic post hole emplacement, um, to hear for, about the experiences of uh, network operators and PIs who have already been doing this. Um, we want to encourage people to share their successes but also the failures and the lessons that they've learned in doing this so that we can all as a community benefit from this experience and, and help move things forward. Um, a huge part of this is going to be assembling examples 
of post hole placement sites um, and, and very thorough high quality documentation so that if people want to go do a review or a reanalysis of the factors that make a good post hole, they'll have access to that data. That's not something that's currently described in traditional seismic metadata, um, but is something that's going to be really important for uh, kind of comparing different installations and figuring out what works well under a variety of different conditions. And after all of this, um, we want to identify and assemble a set of best practices that we recommend for uh, if someone wants to go and dig their own post holes and use that. So here's uh, the, the scope of the project. We're kicking it off um, in January with this webinar and our first discussion panel, including case studies from three regional seismic networks. Um, over the next few months, we're going to organize other discussions of focused topics uh, on post hole emplacement. These will be held every couple of weeks, uh, typically on uh, Thursday afternoons. And if you want to present on this, um, we warmly welcome you to nominate yourself, um, nominate a topic that you might be interested in. Um, starting in about June, we're going to start gathering information on post hole emplacements, so uh, detailed descriptions of those. And, the, uh, and perhaps changes in data quality that people have observed. Um, and then by December, we want to assemble and submit a manuscript with a compilation of recommended best practices for this and publish that archive that we've assembled. So our two deliverables from this project are going to be that digital database of post hole emplacements, including um, extensive documentation on the uh, practices used to install to construct and install the sensors um, and then that manuscript that will uh, be contributed to the new manual of seismological observatory practice or the nmsop um, summarizing uh, our best practices for post hole emplacement so uh, the project website will be a clearinghouse for this kind of information so a uh, link is there and keep an eye on it as the series progresses <clears throat> All right, so as I've mentioned before, um, our case studies and discussions uh, in this webinar and in future ones are going to delve deep into really technical details, and we hope to cover a lot of the history of post hole sensor development. Um, Casey and I have learned in the last week that if you mention that you are presenting a webinar, and you're going to discuss some of the history of post hole developments, you get a lot of people uh, suggesting important studies to cover um, and certain deployments that they'd like to see in certain results. Um, but it's just not feasible for us to cover in this one kickoff webinar in the half hour of time or so that I have the entire history and development of post hole emplacements, both because there's so much work that has been done and also because as I mentioned before, a lot of this stuff is not written down and accessible um, to the general public. So I'm not going to even attempt to cover the entire history and motivation between or behind uh, why post holes were developed and how, how they have um, become what they are today. Um, I'm gonna leave that to panelists and future presenters. And what I wanna do with the 20 or 30 minutes that I have today is lay down a bit of background, just the basics, for folks who may be less familiar with seismic instrumentation or data quality control or field, field work in seismology, but who are still interested in this topic and want to be able to learn more and follow along with our discussions. So I wanna cover what exactly do we mean when we say post hole um, and a little bit about how all those kind of sensors came to be, um, a little bit about how we tend to talk about noise. And then I wanna share with you uh, some of my, the reasons that I am interested in this topic because I suspect that a lot of participants and a lot of panelists uh, might have very similar goals, but I'll give you my specific take on this. All right. So uh, uh, briefly, very quickly touching on the evolution of sensors and seismology. In the beginning, we had huge sensors that were vault sensors. They took up rooms. Sometimes they weighed several tons. In general, uh, there has been a trend towards making sensors smaller with a broader bandwidth. And this sort of has diverged into 
uh, vault sensors. So things that are intended to be installed on the surface or in shallow holes where humans can access them, right? So an STS-2 is a typical vault sensor. You actually have to be able to touch the sensor in order to be able to lock and unlock it, right? You can't put that down a hole and expect things to go well. On the other side, we have the development of borehole sensors um, with the idea of avoiding noise produced on the surface, whether from human activity or you know, atmospheric pressure or temperature changes. Um, and this, um, these were developed to um, avoid those noise sources in order to detect very faint signals uh, from perhaps distant sources, whether tectonic or human induced. Um, and both, both borehole sensors drilled very deep into rock um, and vault sensors installed in permanent observatories have continued to evolve um, since the invention of seismometers, essentially. Uh, but in the last decade or, or so, there's been uh, this kind of middle ground developed for post hole sensors. And so these are um, sensors that you are, you know, for people that are not going to spend the considerable amount of money required to drill a post hole and buy a borehole sensor that um, can take advantage of that extremely quiet noise environment, but who are also looking to get maybe a little bit uh, improved data quality over to what you would get out of a typical vault. So um, post hole sensors sort of fill the niche between the two. So when I talk about post holes, that's what I'm talking about. Um, I sat down and tried to write a, a nice specific definition of what a post hole sensor was and what a post hole actually is. And I think it can kind of be summed up as it's not a vault, it's not a borehole. <laughs> Um, it's typically, it's an installation that is typically at a depth of a few meters to maybe a few tens of meters. If you are able to drill that deep with an, an auger or something that's not a super specialized drill rig for hard rock. Um, and a, a key feature I think, uh, is that you are trying to produce minimal disturbance to the surrounding material when you are installing this. So contrast that with uh, digging a vault with a backhoe and pouring in a few cubic yards of concrete. Um, the goal here is to drill a small hole just big enough to get your sensor in and uh, not disturb your host material. So when I talk about post holes, this is kind of what I'm thinking about here. All right, so moving on, i um, gonna talk a little bit about how um, the seismology instrumentation and the network community tends to talk about noise at seismometers. So one of the things that you will probably see over and over and over again um, are these Peterson uh, high and low noise models. So these were established by John Peterson of ASL in 1993 um, to sort of define uh, reasonable, reasonable bounds of station performance. So what he did is uh, calculated power spectra for a range of permanent network sites featuring high quality instrumentation and defined, okay, here is the lowest amount of noise that I see at these stations. And here's the highest level of noise that we can observe and still consider a station to be reasonably useful for sort of global broadband seismology. Um, these are referred to as the new high and low noise models, even though they were established in 1993. So you'll see the, you may see these acronyms NHNM and LNM a lot. Um, and these are just referring to these two noise models. Uh, moving on, uh, one other thing that you'll also see frequently are these uh, PSD PDF plots. So these are power spectral density plots um, or power spectral density curves combined in a, to show a probability density function and all this is saying is, how likely am I to observe a certain level of noise at a certain frequency in the time window that I'm looking at? Um, so these are calculated by taking your seismogram in the time window of interest, slicing it into a lot of overlapping segments, calculating power spectra, and then creating this 2D histogram of power versus frequency. So this is really helpful to sort of give you a snapshot of the performance of a station. So. Uh, you can see sort of the, the typical ambient noise at a site. 
You can also see signals uh, from low probability, but uh, higher power events like teleseismic earthquakes. Um, at this particular station, you can see uh, that we have quite a bit of noise from road traffic, for example, and then low probability events like mass recenters and calibrations. So these are very widely used in network quality control. Uh, we see the Peterson noise models plotted here. And generally speaking, um, the quieter the station, the lower the noise. Uh, you don't want to see anything dropping below this low noise model that usually indicates a broken sensor. Um, we certainly don't want to be above the, above the high noise model for most applications because that means that your local side effects are probably going to overwhelm uh, earthquake signals of interest, very generally speaking. Um, the choice of processing parameters in generating these plots matters. Um, if you are looking for specific uh, signals or uh, at specific frequencies, you, you can tune uh, the smoothing and the slicing uh, in these algorithms to avoid smoothing through your signal of interest. Um, and finally, uh, these are usually plotted in units of decibels, but they're still just power spectra, um, um, but referred to decibels with respect to acceleration. So um, yeah, just a, a look at a common, very, very commonly used way of looking at station performance here. All right, so um, one other thing I want to point out is that every seismologist, everyone who's going to present here probably has a slightly different idea of what high frequency or long period means. And we're going to frequently switch between units of frequency, um, so hertz and period and seconds. Um, so that's just something to be aware of if you're new to these kinds of discussions. Um, but in general, the way I like to think of this is I kind of chop it up, chop up this whole frequency band of interest from you know tens of hertz to hundreds or thousands of seconds into sort of three frequency bands. So uh, short frequencies or high, high frequency short periods. Um, and that's anything above about one hertz in my mind. Um, noise in this band is usually caused by human activity. Um, so factories, trains, railroads, uh, things like that noise between about one and 20 seconds period um, is caused by, is we call it the micro seismic band. And that is mostly dominated by uh, ocean storms, signals produced by ocean storms that we observe everywhere throughout Earth, even in continental interiors. And then uh, for me, long periods start at about 20 seconds and extend all the way up to normal modes or tides. Um, and noise in this band is typically produced by very local site response to atmosphere, atmospheric and thermal changes at that site. So we can, uh, we can mitigate noise in each of these bands uh, at high frequencies, usually by um, selecting sites that are far from human activity or drilling very deep. Uh, not much you can do to get away from micro seisms. If you need to have a seismometer in a certain location and you're near the coast, you're kind of stuck with what you got. Um, and then at long periods, this is where, this is one area where um, changing the type of installation from a vault to a post hole or borehole um, has shown a lot of promise in reducing noise levels. All right, so just a, a quick overview of uh, what can produce noise at, on seismometers. Like I said, uh, at high frequencies, it's mostly human activity. So siting criteria can be developed to minimize the impact of this. Um, so here's an example from the lower 48 um, transportable array, which uh, we uh, in grad school we took and, or, uh, and used for uh, the spree flexible array deployment, um, modeling our criteria off of the lower 48 TA and uh, avoiding things like railroads, highways, driveways, tall objects. And this proved very, very effective for us in helping minimize the amount of high frequency noise on our stations. Uh, some of you may have uh, seen this really cool paper that came out recently um, with more than 70 co-authors who all took a look at stations uh, installed mostly in urban areas that saw this drastic drop in high frequency noise. Uh, this is, you know, above, about 1 to 20 hertz. So as lockdowns were implemented due to COVID, 
stations that are close to cities often saw a drastic re reduction in the amount of noise that they were recording. This was not observed at all seismic stations around the world, especially those that are installed in remote areas, um, but just a, a really interesting phenomenon um, that, that, you know, kind of showing that we're all, we're all going through similar things in some ways. Um, like I mentioned, um, storms in the ocean generate these micro seismic signals between about one and 20 seconds, generally speaking, um, and these are observed everywhere on Earth. So even at a station in the continental interior, like this one in Utah, um, still recording signals from that are generated by a hurricane off the East Coast. Um, and again, this, this energy is generated by the interaction of waves in the ocean with the Earth's crust and is observed everywhere. Um, long period noise on seismic stations um, can be produced by surface tilt. So here's a particularly striking example of how a change in atmospheric pressure can actually produce a observed seismic signal. Um, just because this is a relatively shallow installation, as a storm front passes over, we actually see a tilt recorded on the horizontals of that station. Um, this is a very dramatic example of this, but we also know um, that much smaller changes in atmospheric pressure can still produce tilting signals on shallow installations. Some signals are also produced by extremely localized uh, noise sources like cows walking by shallow vaults um, if you are in very, very soft sediment. All right, and then finally, um, one source of noise that we might not often think about, especially if you're used to working with um, the type of broadband instrumentation that is installed in things like the transportable array, um, is that sensors and digitizers also have their own self noise. And depending on the sensor that you are looking at, this may become more of a factor. So a, a common misconception that I've seen is that well, I, you know, I have a 120, an instrument with 120 second uh, corner frequency, so it should be really quiet, right? And that, that's not necessarily the case. So a, a sensor can have the same response shape. For example, we have a, a Volt Trillium 120 here and a Trillium Compact, um, but these two sensors will have different self noise levels. So this Volt sensor is very quiet um, and it can, resolve the, the low noise model at long periods or be very close to it. Uh, whereas the Trillium Compact is not designed to be as quiet. Um, it has other uh, reasons that make it a very attractive sensor for a lot of installations, but it is not designed to resolve these super, super uh, low amplitude, long period signals. So that's a thing to be aware of. If you're looking at data from a Trillium Compact and it's not close to the low noise model out here, that doesn't mean something's wrong with the sensor you're just seeing differences in engineering and design. All right. Okay, so now I wanna share a little bit more about why I've become interested in this and what I'm hoping to get out of this uh, series of discussions in this working group. So at ASL, we operate more than 300 seismic stations all over the world. Um, and all of these different networks, all of these stations have different instrumentation, different emplacement types. They're installed in very different environments. And we make these choices because we have a lot of different stakeholders and monitoring goals that we need to be able to support. So uh, we have things everywhere from a, a deep borehole in the ice in Antarctica to a very shallow direct burial installation in the desert in California. So my job as network manager is to make sure that each one of those stations is producing high quality data, that it's operating reliably, and that we're operating efficiently. Um, so kind of getting the best, uh, best, da best data we can for our taxpayers' buck. So one of the big reasons I'm, I'm interested in post holes is improving the reliability of our sites. So we have a number of vaults out there that are getting old um, and they leak and broadband sensors really do not like to go swimming and I don't want to run uh, an ocean bottom seismometer program. <laughs> uh, so post holes are attractive to me because post hole sensors are designed to operate in the environmental conditions that uh, kind of attack the vaults at a lot of our sites. 
Um, they do much better with groundwater, things like that. Um, burying your sensor also simply makes it harder for curious humans or animals to vandalize or investigate or, you know, tamper with your sensor. Um, we do have sites that have vandalism issues and burying your significant investment in the ground so that it's harder to get to just makes sense. Um, the second reason that I am really interested in post holes is that I think there's a huge potential to improve the quality of long period horizontal component data that's available in the central, central and Eastern US. And there are a number of uh, different areas that this could contribute to scientifically. So having the ability to analyze horizontal component data as well as vertical data might help us advance our understanding of source processes, uh, stress orientations of the structure of the crust and upper mantle um, can contribute to discussions of seismic hazard and so much more. So uh, yeah, so with the adoption of the N4 by ASL, so this is the leftover transportable array, um, we left behind about one in every four transportable array sites, we have uh, much denser station coverage than we have ever before in the past in the central and eastern US. And so getting good quality horizontal data out of these sensors um, could be really transformative for a lot of different areas. And uh, we've seen that post holes have potential to improve this. So this is work that's uh, been done uh, by Casey and others at IRIS. So comparing the, uh, the transportable array data from the lower 48, right? Um, so this is the red is the median power spectral density curve, like I mentioned earlier, from the entire lower 48 TA. Here are the verticals, here are the horizontals. And these were installed in shallow sort of tank style vaults. And I'll talk about those in a, a bit more, show you a diagram in a minute. But transitioning from that vault emplacement that required a backhoe to dig and disturb the ground considerably to a post hole style sensor in Alaska produced significant improvement on the horizontal components. This is at least 10 dB, 10 decibels of difference. And that is huge, right? This is, this is, you know, a difference of, of, you know, several, you know, maybe a several magnitude units, depending on the earthquake of being able to do original moment tensor, for example. So this is really, really, really cool. And I'm, this makes me very excited about the potential of using post holes in the networks that I manage. All right, so as I mentioned, um, ASL adopted the N4 network in 2019. Um, so these are stations that were initially installed in 2008 um, through 2013 as part of the Earthscope transportable array. Um, and about one in four, hence the N4 network code, um, were retained so that we had denser monitoring in the central and eastern US. And these, uh, as the TA was rolling through, the design that was used for installation involves a, um, a tank made of like a corrugated drainage pipe that's about a meter across and two meters deep, um, dug into the surface uh, with a vault style sensor, um, and then is uh, backfilled in and buried. So, and this was, um, this was developed because postal sensors were not really a thing at the time the TA was beginning. But now that we have the advantage of 10 or more years of uh, advances in sensor design and emplacement techniques, um, as we go back and uh, upgrade and maintain these vaults, we have some opportunities to significantly improve um, data quality and reliability of these installations. Okay, so one really important use of N4 data um, is in regional moment tensor calculations. So speaking to my colleagues up in Golden at the USGS National Earthquake Information Center, and also Bob Herman of St. Louis University, uh, regional moment tensors typically have been very challenge challenging to calculate for magnitudes less than about 3.5 in the central and eastern US. And there would be a number of advantages to pushing that threshold lower. So as I mentioned before, this gives us uh, more information about uh, fault orientation and crustal stresses, and then also being able to use a, a moment magnitude measurement for smaller events consistently 
um, even in that magnitude three to four range, um, helps provide more consistent magnitudes for the source catalogs that get used in the National Seismic Hazard Map. Um, as many not network operators know, uh, for smaller magnitude earthquakes, you often have to use different local magnitude scales and converting from these for, converting from these scales to MW for things like seismic hazard assessment uh, can be a, a big source of uncertainty. So the, the smaller we can use MW or similar measurements, uh, it's just one less uncertainty in our hazard mapping. So my, my challenge as a network operator is to say, okay, how can I support this? Can I get N4 horizontals to be quieter at these long periods around uh, 10 seconds and above? And how, in fact, how quiet do they need to be to uh, provide these, provide information for these lower magnitude regional moment tensors? So talking to Bob Herman, uh, maybe a reasonable target to look for is, can we use stations out to about 450 kilometers to try to push for regional magnitude or regional moment tensor is down to about magnitude two and a half. So um, trying to establish a, a rough rule of thumb, how quiet does my station need to be to be useful very generally in for these kinds of events. Um, so we'll look at the state of the network now and then use that information to guide uh, decisions about which stations to target for post hole upgrades and uh, help our QC folks identify stations that need improvement or aren't performing like they're supposed to be. So the goal is to, at least um, for me in the next year or so, pick a couple of stations to convert from the TA tank style vault to a post hole installation, test it out, see what kind of data quality improvements we can get. Um, but to first assess how quiet do we really need to be shooting for, right? Um, Let's look at all the stations that have recorded small magnitude events over a range of distances and look at the noise levels there. All right. So looking at this, um, I can grab uh, noise profiles from the Iris Mustang system. Um, Mustang will give you those PDFs I was showing earlier and also statistics on those PDFs if you want to know the mean or the 90th percentile. Um, let's look at this and then see um, what noise levels are suitable or have, or have actually been used um, for stations in regional moment tensors. So we get this nice relationship between the noise level at a station. This is at a, a period of about 30 seconds. Um, and we see logically that the closer you are to the earthquake, the noisier your station can be and still be useful. But if we want to shoot for having every N4 station be useful, um, if it's within a certain radius of an earthquake, we can pick that distance and say, okay, if I want every station within 450 kilometers of my earthquake to be useful, then I'm looking for no horizontal noise levels below 140 dB at 30 seconds. So there's a lot of different uh, choices of parameters here. That's just one example um, that we could use to establish a rule. So the goal then would be to find the stations that are not performing that well and try to drop the long period noise levels by converting them to post hole installations. So what I hope to get out of this, uh, of this webinar series is to, uh, I wanna know, does this actually work? Will it help me improve the reliability of my stations? I wanna hear from others' experiences. Um, exactly what kinds of improvement in data quality can I expect after converting a station um, from a vault to a post hole, right? I know my long period should, be, should get quieter. Maybe my high frequencies will drop a bit, but what are the conditions that I need to meet um, in order to make that actually happen? Uh, what best practices does my field team need to know about and follow so that we can make sure that these post holes are as high quality as possible? Um, how does this actually work in the real world, right? We can drill test holes in one location and be pretty confident that it works there. But then you go drill in the clay in Mississippi and you're at a whole different set of site conditions than we have here in the high desert in Albuquerque. So I wanna hear from a range of experiences. Um, and then I also wanna know what we don't know, right? What, how can, how can my team, by going out and installing all of these post holes, contribute to exploration and development in this area? 
So that's my take. That's what I'm hoping to get out of the series. And I'm, I'm very excited that uh, we get to hear from a lot of people about this. All right, so that is the end of uh, my presentation. Just to remind folks of the timeline and deliverables for this project. Um, going to be a series of panel discussions. Uh, we're going to ask folks to document their sites and assemble this all in a database. And then we'll all put our heads together, come up with um, a compilation of recommended best practices and submit a manuscript um, or a chapter for the MSOP. Okay, so that's, that's what I've got for today. And we'll turn it over to the panelists in just a moment. Um, were there any questions, Casey? Yes, <laughs> there were um, a couple of questions came in and uh, please feel free to throw more questions out there. Um, we'll get to as many as we can and we can also uh, follow up with some of these with all of our panelists and feel free also panelists if you have any questions for Emily, feel free to unmute. But I'll start with one here from um, Gary Pavlis. Um, he says, I would like the panelists to address the question of what is the fundamental source of noise that post holes seem to suppress as a function of frequency. In particular, what do we really know and what are just hypotheses that have not been fully tested? So like the fundamental source of noise that post holes are changing when, when you go from a vault to a post hole. Gotcha. Good question. <laughs> So I would say that I think one of those sources that we're pretty pretty confident we can say that we're getting away from is those surface tilts produced by changes in atmospheric pressure. Um, so uh, Paul Bowden had a, a paper in I think 2012, um, basically documenting that you know they saw increased noise um, with changes in atmospheric pressure and changes in wind, um, and the deeper you go. Um, there's there's a relationship you can calculate and the your sensitivity to that kind of surface signal that surface tilt um, drops off quite considerably so that's that's one source that we know that we're getting away from um, changes in temperature as well um, you know the deeper you go the more stable your the temperature in your surrounding material is so those are those are two sources and of course those are also high frequency cultural noise that's being attenuated um, rapidly as the deeper you go. Um, do any of our other panelists want to chime in on that? I can chime in, but I, I probably talk about this in a couple minutes anyway. Um, yeah, I can I chime think, in. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Renata. Yeah. All right. Um, I was going to say, in, like in the Ocean Islands, such as where I am in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, one of our main sources of noise is not only humans, but also the ocean itself. Um, and that's a consistent noise issue um, as far as looking, especially at teleseismic data. Yeah, specifically to the question uh, of like, what's the proof that these post holes really do better? Um, so I'm at the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, uh, which is also where Paul Bowden is. And we started installing these post holes in 2017 but we haven't really done the due diligence to look into improved imp uh, performance or, or not. I mean, they, they perform well, but whether they really do better than a fault in place sensor, we, we don't really know yet. Uh, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Great. And I think this folds into the next one nicely. Um, so another question here from Dan McNamara. Um, the Alaska TA example showed good reduction of noise. However, the noise still ramps up quite rapidly with increasing period. This is likely due to tilt. What can be done to reduce the tilt in the post hole style vault? Casey, do you have thoughts on Alaska TA? <laughs> I mean, my, I guess the answer to get away from tilt, I would say is always going deeper, but obviously that's a, that increases your cost and adds other logistical challenges. Yeah, I'd say this is one of the, I mean, I think a lot of these questions and I, I think the, the people asking the questions realize too that these are the questions we are trying to answer through through the process of compiling the, the experiences and the, the test cases that we have across a, a wide variety of environments. So yeah, whether it's things like, um, you know, casing material, the, the method of drilling, um, yeah. all of those kinds Routing. of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, how, how well you grouted in all, all those little details that hopefully we'll be able to dig into in our technical discussions. Yeah. Oh, I see another comment saying, yeah, like getting getting away from moisture is really important. So this is um, manufacturers have put a lot of work into um, developing connection or connectors and sensors that can survive harsher conditions in postal. So instead of being in a, a nice clean dry vault with no groundwater in it, you know, these, that's, there's some some harsh stuff out there that these might be expected to encounter. So having a uh, good sensor development helps, but then also, yeah, op network operators need to know the best ways to construct, um, you know, postal installations so that we can preserve that investment um, in, in these, you know, very expensive sensors. Okay, um, yeah, and, and sorry, we are just getting into the panelists and everything too, but they will also have uh, presentations later. So I think some of these questions might um, be answered in those. So I don't wanna go into it too much. Um, but I, I'll just have this one. This one's kind of an interesting one um, from Chris Hayward. Um, Without a constraint on budget, would a borehole generally be preferred? It seems like the cost is something that needs to be well-documented both for borehole and post hole. And I know this is something that you're considering, Emily, considering you have so many stations, um, a cost per station for an upgrade is, is quite the decision to make. Right, yeah, and that's, that's one of the reasons that I'm so eager to hear about different experiences so that we can, yeah, kind of plan better for this and say, like, if I put this much money into this station, is it going to give me significantly better data quality? And how do I pick the right station to upgrade? Because, you know, as much as I would love to go out and do all of them, that's clearly not feasible, right? So let's let's pick the ones that are gonna give us the best return on this investment. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of questions I see in here about, well, what about casing? What about grouting? How does casing affect noise levels? These are all questions that, yeah, we, we don't know. Like, I don't know if anyone has ever sat and done a, a, a big analysis of a lot of different installs a lot of different conditions and compared it. So that's exactly the kind of stuff that we're hoping to dig into um, in this series of discussions. So um, I guess, shall we move on to our uh, panel and case studies? Sure, yeah, I was gonna have a break, but you know what, I, I think if we just keep going, I think, <laughs> I think everyone, are all our panelists okay with that? Sure. Yeah, okay. I think we might as well just keep going because it seems like the discussion is just going to continue. So, um, so yeah, I guess moving on to our our next speaker um, will be um, Dr. Elizabeth Vanacore. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Vanacore is a, an associate research professor at the University of Puerto Rico, specializing in imaging Earth structure using array seismology. And she's also the coordinator for seismology research at the Puerto Rico Seismic Network. So, and has much experience in postal emplacement. Well, I would say much experience in the placement, but much more on the user side, because um, I am a seismologist and I am a research seismologist. So I'm the person who looks at these postals and I'm like, it's a new toy. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's see if we can get better signals. And I'm going to talk from the Puerto Rico um, perspective. And the Puerto Rico Seismic Network, the reason we started getting these postals in the first place is unfortunately Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma, which essentially decimated our network. And thankfully, with some support from the USGS and the federal government, we are getting some upgrades to improve resiliency. And part of those upgrades, including adding pulse tolls into our system. So just to show you where we currently are, um, I, I have to show waveforms, I'm a seismologist. Um, this is the current broadband station distribution. I kind of cut off um, a bit of the stations we have in the Dominican Republic and includes not only the Puerto Rico seismic network stations, but also temporary stations we have currently installed in the Southwest for the ongoing um, Southwest Puerto Rico seismic sequence. Um, you can see um, in this plot, we currently don't have broadbands um, in the Virgin Islands still, but they are some strong motion stations that have been installed. So this is our station distribution. First thing you should notice is we are an ocean island. 
which means one of our big noise sources is going to be the ocean noise, especially given the topography on our island. Um, you notice the mountain range near the center or south central of our island, that becomes a huge logistical problem for our technicians because you might be able to put a seismometer in there, but you have coverage of um, tropical, tropical forests as well as communication issues, which makes it very difficult to install seismometers in the center of the island. So most of our stations end up being near the coast, which does allow for ocean noise to creep in. And just for fun, this um, I added some size, um, seismic, um, seismic signals from the last 5.4 magnitude event we had over the weekend in the Virgin Islands. So it shows you, even though we have activity in the Southwest, yes, we're still having significant earthquakes elsewhere in our air responsibility. So let's start with where we are before. Um, and a number of our stations are still in these very typical faults that we have built in the Puerto Rico seismic network. We have usually a lot, many of our vaults have three meter deep concrete isolated base vaults. And then you put in multiple instruments into these vaults. However, during the hurricane, some of our vaults um, unfortunately became flooded. Um, and that can cause issues with our seismometers. Um, I have shown you an example of a flooded seismometer. And as Emily pointed out, broadband seismometers do not like the ghost of me. <laughs> So I'm going to start out with a quiz. I'm going to talk about teleseismic signals. Um, I have two seism um, seismograms here. These are two events of about 6.2 and 6.3 magnitude from Indonesia recorded on a station in southeastern Puerto Rico. Same site, one is a postal, and one is our, was our vault station. I've put up the poll right now. You're going to vote A or B. Which one do you think is the postal? All right, so, so we now have the poll results. It looks like A1, and yes, you were correct. A is actually the postal upgraded station. So with this postal station, um, one thing that I have noticed as a researcher is the teleseismic signals are clearer from similar events that beforehand, if I'm gonna go and make a, try to make a pick or create a receiver function or for, to get a P wave or an S wave pick, for tomography, it was much more difficult and much higher noise levels on the vault station than the broad base station. This is currently only qualitative and something quantitative um, would be a great um, opportunity for research as part of this project. So if I go zoom in and take a closer look, again, I cut the top is our new signal. Um, the bottom is the old signal. Um, please note that I have low pass filtered this with a one second filter, um, one second corner. And that is because otherwise the signal from 2021 would be dominated by many small events in the Southwestern Puerto Rico seismic sequence. Um, but as far as even as a qualitative, if someone, if you had a student hand pick this, you would see an improvement in the actual be able to pick quality. And especially with looking at traditional signal noise ratios, which is usually used if you're looking at teleseismic work or tomographies or receiver functions, that's the first sort. You do a signal noise ratio, and signal noise ratio is higher on the postal than it is on the broadband. I'm sorry, on the vault station. <laughs> now, the reality we have in Puerto Rico is you can't put a postal everywhere. It is very difficult to drill into coastal areas. Um, where you have then have automatic seawater intrusion. You have areas that are trying to drill into basalt. Um, I'm hoping in some of the future webinars that we get Jose Cancel or um, the USGS team has been helping us install to discuss this. But it makes it very difficult because you end up with a mixed network. And this is again this 2021 event from Indonesia where I have just plotted up the seismograms. And you can think if you're just looking at this, you can say, oh, I think that maybe AOPR looks like it might be postal or the less noisy stations on the postal. But that is actually not the case. Now, if you look at this plot, it shows you that some of the, the red ones I just highlighted are the postal stations. 
And you notice that uh, the top one, Aguadilla, is somewhat on the noisy side, and PRSN at the bottom, again the postal, is still on the noisy side. So postal is not going to fix your noise problem. If you have a noisy site, it might improve it. And yes, I have seen drastic improvements in Aguadilla and PRSN as far as just raw signal, but it's not gonna fix a noisy site. It might improve it a bit, but you have to think about a cost benefit analysis saying, is it worth drilling a hole and putting a postal station there if I'm only to get a minimal amount of improvement? Uh, so this is something that maybe we should have thought about more when we were choosing sites for our postals. Now, I kind of pulled that one, just did a quick on the vertical components. Obviously, we're going to see more of the horizontal components is how do we start looking at these differences? If you want to go more quantitative, one way we can do is start using these um, PSD plots and start comparing. It's like, okay, what did it look like before we had went from postal to after the postal? Um, again, on um, this particular part, you don't see much difference. I think on the horizontals, we would see much different, um, different signal. But this is if we want to start looking at quantitative, which I think is the next step rather than this qualitative, how, well, how good is picking, how's it going to signal noise ratio for a teleseismics. Um, we can start looking at these power specialisms and maybe doing some differential work. And I'm not talking about the locals um, for one reason is because currently, since we had installed the, post, the postal stations, we've been dominated by the Southwest and Puerto Rico seismic sequence, which comes out very clearly on all of our stations. And this is because right now, the Puerto Rico Seismic Network, we are still prioritizing events. And those will be events that are larger than 3.5, which is significant, events that are felt, or then events that were caught by an automatic early bird system and set off an alarm. So these micro seismic events, which postals are supposed to help with, we have, don't have a huge data set as far as analysis to look at right now. And again, that's something that should be done in the near future. A couple of takeaways. Um, yes, a disaster can be a seed of innovation and saying, yes, we can now improve this. Um, Ocean Islands, we do see some it's, um, improvement of signals, um, but it's something to look, think about long term. We do have a quant, we, right now I only have a qualitative, we can think about a quantitative analysis. And the big one is postals will not fix a noisy site. It may improve the quality, but the site is still going to be a dominant factor in your noise. <laughs> Um, I think I'll leave it there and. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I think we'll just go ahead and um, switch to the next panelist. And then I think we'll take all the questions at the end as everyone saw, because I accidentally posted that to everybody, um, not just panelists. <laughs> um, so our next panelist is um, Dr. Christine uh, Panko. She is the Associate Director for the University of Utah Seismograph Stations and also works as a research professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics, focusing on the nearby intermountain seismicity, induced earthquakes, and detection of other seismic signals. And I will get your slides up here. I think we're good. Great. Uh, thanks. Um, so I'm I'm going to talk about an experiment we're doing instead of the network because that's where we actually have the, the post hole stations um, installed. And uh, Corey Hatch is our seismic engineer who's on this call. So if there's technical questions regarding the actual installation, hopefully we'll get him to answer that. And then um, these are relatively new stations. A lot of people have been looking at data. Um, the rest of our engineering and field staff have helped to install those. And so that I want to make sure to acknowledge everyone. So next slide, please. Uh, so just briefly, this experiment is called FORGE, the Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. And this is a essentially a laboratory to establish the technology needed for a commercial pathway to enhance geothermal systems. So this is for primarily induced seismicity. So the next slide, please. So the goal here, and I want to give a little bit of background so you could get a sense for why we care about putting in post holes um, and borehole stations in this area is we actually just completed drilling this first well. So there's a, a vertical well that goes into granite, um, hot granite, so you can see temperatures there in excess of 200 degrees C. And then it's drilled horizontally. So we just drilled the first of these wells. It was finished at the end of December. So the drilling technology seems to be working pretty well right now. So 
Um, so why does this, uh, why do we care about the seismicity? Uh, for two reasons. One is when they go to, to develop the enhanced geothermal system, they want to monitor the reservoir growth. So can you actually monitor the seismicity as you're enhancing the system and track it so that you can drill a second well and connect fractures? So there's, that's one level of monitoring. So down to say minus magnitudes of minus two, minus three. And then there's always uh, the potential for induced seismicity from this type of um, activity. And so we also have an active um, induced seismic mitigation plan that has a traffic light system where we're required to have uh, magnitude of completeness at um, zero for this site. So the next slide, please. Um, so for that reservoir development, we actually have deep boreholes going down um, several thousand feet. Um, but what I'll talk about today is um, the local seismic monitoring, which, pretty, which is used more for um, the traffic light system. So, um, sorry, the map shows so small. Um, FORK is a shallow borehole. So it goes down um, to, uh, sorry, I work with engineers, so everything's in feet, and then I switch back. So FORK is about a thousand feet. And then what we've been installing are, we've installed three post hole instruments, and these are deeper post holes than um, Emily sort of talked about for her guidelines. So FSB1, FSB2, and FSB3 are um, shallow post holes in sort of the 30 meter range. We'll be adding three additional post holes before this summer. That's uh, FSB four, five, and six. And then the stations that start with FOR are surface stations. Um, and FOR three is essentially co-located with FSB three. So uh, the next slide, please. Um, so just to give you a sense of um, the installations, and I just threw in this shallow borehole for comparison. Uh, so it's at 280 meters. It has um, three component 15 Hertz geophone and a three component silicon audio accelerometer. Um, this is our standard setup. So we have, um, you can see the pipe coming out of the ground. So that's where the, the borehole is. There's um, two barrels there, one for the digitizer, one for batteries. Um, and the top picture is just a picture of these um, sensors together in the same um, uh, enclosure for deployment. So that's what the shallow borehole looks like, but we're talking about post holes today. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see the, the post hole stations. And, and one of the questions that came up was, well, what about noise? Well, on this particular site, this is actually a renewable energy corridor. So we're sitting right adjacent to a wind farm. So you can see the windmills in the back of the picture at the top. So we have noise from the windmills. Um, this is an area that gets free ranged. So there's no cows in the picture, but there's typically cows wandering around all over. We have active drilling going on and we're in the middle of the desert. So we get a lot of, and there's a wind farm there. So there's a lot of wind. So those are, the types of stations were a look at the noise source. And for this particular area, you can see the mountains in the background and that's granite. But where our, our site is, is actually on a basin. So this is sediment and it get, the sediment gets deeper as you go to the west. So our shallow holes are 25 to 30 meters. Um, these are cased with steel. Um, the lengths of the casing are 20, 20 foot lengths uh, what, and the joints are welded. Um, some specs on the inner and outer dimensions. Um, again, in the picture, you'll see that there's two barrels. Um, careful about grounding between the tower. There's a tower for telemetry, the barrels and the well casing. And uh, the bottom picture is a, is a picture of the well casing showing some of the grounding. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, what we have in these holes are the nanometrics cascadias. So these are three component trillium compact broadband sensors plus three component 4G Titan accelerometers. Uh, 
talking about tilt and stabilizing and different things like that. Corey designed some homemade centralizers for develop for deploying these, and you can see the wings there. So these are lowered into the bottom of the hole, and then we sand them in place. Um, these are the measured total tilt um, that we got from the three different the three different stations. So from 0.3 to 0.8. So that's kind of what the construction looks like. Corey could answer more questions on those details. Um, but the next slide, I haven't started looking at the PSDs. We've had these for a little bit. We've only had these for a few months and we're more, more concerned about getting the data into our system and dealing with triggering. So I've been looking at the high frequency data together with colleagues, Maria Mezermetri and Jim Peshman. And we've just been looking at sort of that average absolute value of the background noise. So just going and grabbing noise windows. And we've been playing with sampling rates and doing this for different days. So these are just some numbers to throw out there. But one thing I want to talk to, and, and Elizabeth talked on this as well, is um, station FORU sits in the Mineral Mountains and it's on rock. It's a very quiet site. So our mean background noise is at 8.43, OK? I've circled over here on the right, the FSB stations, um, which are the shallow boreholes and the deeper borehole. And I just want to point out that sitting in this basin, right, all the sediment where the windmills are and the cows are walking, to get to the same noise, background noise level that we see on our rock sites um, in the mountains, you really have to go to about a thousand feet where our shallow boreholes are closer to a hundred feet and, and they by far do a, a much better job than on the surface. So FOR3, I mentioned it was co-located with FSV3. So we're seeing a huge improvement in the, um, by going deeper, but um, to actually get to our, the quality that we have at the rock sites, um, you have to go even deeper. So um, again, this is just vertical component we're working on triggering. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, just a couple of waveform examples. This is a magnitude minus 0 0.8 that's located about two kilometers east of the forge site. There's a couple stations here, one on rock, FORU at the top, and then um, FSB2, which is very close to the windmills, is also at 4.3 six kilometers, you can see the difference in the noise level between the rock and uh, the uh, post hole stations. And just to point out, we're picking up events that are smaller than minus 0 0.8. Um, you can see those at the beginning of the trace. Um, and then one, I have one other example um, in the next slide, uh, just showing um, for magnitude two that's located about 80 kilometers to the southeast of station FSB and FOR3. Here's the two, the two um, instrument types. Uh, FOR3 is on the surface. FSB3 is you know about 30 meters. And I just blow up the noise um, to the left and note the different scale. So the, the post hole site is actually much quieter in the noise. Um, so you get a better signal to noise ratio, but um, maybe not what you're what we were expecting to see, um, even having drilled down to a, a hundred feet or so. So I think that's what I have. Um, the next, the last slide is just a picture of the drill rig that went in for drilling the big, um, the the deep hole. It's kind of a fascinating engineering project as well. And that's all that I have. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I'm, I have so many questions, but I think we will continue on um, and there will be time at the end to get to some of the questions that uh, from the audience as well. Um, but for now, I um, would like to proceed. Um, yeah, I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Okay. Um, so yes, with our with our final panelists. So um, Dr. Renata Hartog is a research scientist at the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network located at the University of Washington. And she focuses on earthquake early warning, advancing their earthquake catalog and the operations of the seismic network there. And Renata, do you want to share your slides? 
I think you just have to do share your screen. Perfect. And there we are. Thank you. <laughs> Got it all set up. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, thanks for inviting us to talk about this. And uh, like Carl, Carl, my co-author here, said is like wish we had had this information before we started uh, putting in the post holes. But um, so great, great uh, idea to organize this. Um, we are in uh, uh, the seismic network that's responsible for monitoring the states of Washington and Oregon in the US on the West Coast. Let's see. Oh, great. Hold on. There we go. All right, so what we have and what we try to build are really long-term monitoring sites. Like we want sites that last for 30 years that are uh, designed for robustness and maintainability. And you'll see that uh, to do that, that we our post holes might not actually fit Emily's definition of a post hole. We'll, we'll talk about that. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about our three different site styles and how we dig holes, and then how we decided to create a PVC casing, or but say AKA fault. And then I'll talk a little bit about performance, but like I said, we haven't really had time to really do a good performance analysis. All right, so some sites we might have access to uh, AC power and in that case we can just do this on the right. I assume you all can see my um, cursor on the right here. So we can actually bring a, a power to the site and then we have a simple post and power style um, deployment. And this is what I was referring to. This is our PVC pipe casing that actually is kind of uh, functioning as a vault. But we also have uh, these style deployments here in the in a desert, but if we don't have much vegetation, we can just have these low uh, solar panels. And then we have this third site style with which we call the swing set where we have this big construction that has the G space for the GPS antenna and maybe radio antennas and uh, vertically stacked solar panels so that we can get above vegetation a little bit more easily. All right, so before you can install a sensor, a postal sensor, you have to dig holes. Uh, we do it in whatever means we can find. Um, I, I have a little video of this thing in action, this kind of thing, this uh, hydraulic auger here on the left. Um, this was super efficient and worked really well. Um, but we can't always get our hands on one of these. This is rented. Um, so here on the right, so this is, I think Carl is driving this. And here on the right, Carl is driving this little um, excavator where, so we, we do have to disturb the soil, the ground somewhat to dig a hole. And then here at the top, we're just doing it by hand uh, with, a, this is a jackhammer. And then we also use this, shovels and buckets and whatever we could get to get dirt out. So, so this is the what we ended up designing or Carl, I should say, I was in the, in the field recently with Carl. Carl is our lead field operations person and um, he's somewhere in the audience. He can speak up maybe later, but um, this is what Carl came up with. Um, so we would like to be able to extract sensors. Sensors are the thing that break most often eventually. And so we wanted a way to be able to replace sensors without having to like remove soil and dig up the whole thing. So we went with this PVC uh, pipe construction. And uh, another reason to use PVC is that it has uh, electrical isolation. If you use a metal casing, we were afraid it would uh, cause electrical issues. And then um, it has a good seismic response as well. All right, um, so this is basically how we do it. Once we have a hole, uh, we pour quick setting concrete in it. Then we um, position this PVC vault 
in the hole and really have to put pressure on it to get bubbles and stuff out. And then we have to hold it in place until the concrete sets. sets. And it has to be oriented somewhat in the right correction. Um, tubing here goes it. towards the swing set. Yes, you can. Uh, yeah, I can start. talk now. So, so go ahead. I just you want to do it? Okay, she opened great. It up for me. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this tube here just goes to the swing set to the electrical stuff. And so all the cables go through that. This right now is completely empty. There's a bottom flat bottom cap at there and there. And this thing is eight inches wide. Um, so our goal is to, so then we fill in dirt around the pipe so it's more stable. Oh, sorry. Then we actually, inside that PVC vault, we pour self-leveling cement that needs to cure for about 24 hours. And then um, we can position, carefully position the instrument onto that self-leveling cement. And then we, to, to provide stability, we surround the sensor with aluminum oxide, uh, 60 grit, so really pretty small uh, little pieces. It's kind of like sand, except it's not sand. Um, and then the vault gets topped off with a foam plug that fits exactly in that PVC pipe. And then we cap the vault, but it's not glued on or anything. And then we bury the, the, the plastic top so that you know nobody really can see it. All right, so what about performance? So all our post holes uh, contain one of these Trillium Compact 120 uh, post hole sensors. We tend to use this Cascadia package, which is a nanometrics product where they put two sensors in one, in one housing or attached to each other, basically. So at the bottom here is the accelerometer, which is a Titan post hole. And then at the top is the uh, Trillium Compact post hole. All right, so I'm so grateful to Emily for explaining what these plots are because I was going to go over that and now I feel like I don't really have to. Here's a site that we actually adopted from the transportable array in Eastern Washington. Um, uh, this is a picture here at the top of what the site looked like after we had uh, um, made it a little bit more robust after we adopted it. We added for solar panels, etc. And um, but then wildfires happened and that site got burned up. And so this is a burnt up Quantera 330 data logger. So this, and then when we reoccupied that site, we drilled a post hole and put a trillium cascade in there. And um, these are PDFs from on the left here is from a time period where it's still the original TA vault with a CMG 3T 120 second in it. And then on the right here is from a period where it was, you know, from a recent period. And I think it's about a year's worth. Yeah, both cases it's from January 2015. So what, one year's worth of um, PSDs. Um, and you can see, I, I, just to guide your eye, they're at the same scale on the, on the vertical axis and to horizontal axis. And to guide your eye, this one, minus 135 dB level here is highlighted just to show that they are pretty much you know, identical. The uh, long period noise, which is people are talking about, is a little higher, but this is a trillium compact. And for monitoring purposes, really, we're mostly interested in this, this 10 seconds to uh, 0.1 seconds, aka, you know, we're actually interested in the higher frequencies. That's what we need to record well for local seismicity. Um, and we still do a pretty decent, pretty decent job at these long periods too. Uh, so, so this is a very busy slide. The site we, that I was just showing is here. It's actually, so this is a little bit of uh, Eastern Washington. This horizontal map scale here is almost a hundred kilometers wide. And another uh, gauge of how big this area is, the distance between these two sites is about 37 kilometers. 
And I, what I just did, I just grabbed from the uh, Iris Mustang system, I just grabbed a bunch of P PDFs from, uh, for these sites for the same time period or for as uh, looks like I got tried to get kind of a longer time period. So some sites that haven't been installed for as long uh, might have shorter than others, but they're all on the same scale. And what you can see is that this micro size of peak is very, very dominant and is very similar across sites. You can even see some of this structure in there here that you see in here, same at all these other sites, even the ones that are a little bit farther away. Uh, where it really gets different is in this, you know, the high frequency noise, which is to be expected because that's more of the local environmental noise. And then uh, the, the long periods tend to be all kind of the same. Although this one site, this is, um, oh, and then not all of these are post holes. The post holes I have highlighted here in black boxes or brown boxes. And the difference between black and brown is rock versus more soil type sites. And then you can see, so DDRF probably still has a, a, a non-compact sensor in it from that RTA deduction. Uh, Carl, can you confirm? That's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so these non-boxed, these are not post hole, hole uh, deployments, but you can see that the the uh, noise character looks very similar. So it, um, I'm kind of getting towards the similar conclusion so far, having not done very detailed analysis that really the site is what matters most. Okay, slightly different region of our, I don't know how much time I've used, but this is slightly different view um, let me explain this figure. So this is kind of this PDF as a function of time. So along the uh, y-axis here, you see frequency. So um, this is 10 Hertz and this is down here is 100, se uh, 100 second long period. So this is 10 seconds. So, and then the color scale is from minus 190 to minus 90 dB. So it's actually the same scale that was on the other plots, except this is a different view, also pulled from Iris DMC Mustang. Um, so here, what I wanna show, this is about one year period. And I wanna show, this is also a site called Fork, uh, but this one is on the west coast of Washington and the uh, Olympic Peninsula in a town called Forks or near a town called Forks where made famous by the Twilight series. Um, but you can clearly see this uh, annual signal that there's a lot more uh, micro seismic noise in the winter. All right, so that's how to read these plots. And now I'm gonna show very busy figure. So these are all East components, noise versus time. And some of these don't have very much time because they are new installs, so. Um, really not all of, and again, not all of these sites are post holes, but the dominant feature here is that this, the noise really seems to, uh, especially in the range that we are interested in, which is the micro size and band and the, the higher frequencies, uh, it's really dominated by um, just where the site is. All these coastal sites are much more noisy than like for example, this site here in near Port Angeles is, is over here, it's much quieter. And so are these two more inland sites. So this is OLQN here near Quinault, and then this inland, new inland site, um, which is where we did the hand digging um, is in here. And there's so much cool stuff to see in these figures. For example, you can see this, this, this signal, these two events, uh, micro seism events show up everywhere. Um, what it is exactly, I have no idea. <laughs> it's probably just a bad weather period. Um, but to conclude, I think we are happy with our PVC fault design, seems to work well. Um, we have not yet done a careful analysis of performance for our new postal sites. We have a lot of them. Um, and both noise and local earthquakes are well recorded by our postals and you know other broadband sites as well, but as long as the sensor is functioning well. 
so uh, that's all I had planned. I have some more figures I can show, and I can show a video of the 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 uh, it's a, hydraulic get, auger. Yeah, so go the, ahead. Uh, it's a it's a rock pulverizer. So the contractors, most of our sites that are sited now are sited in uh, in solid rock and they tend to perform better. So uh, the only way to get through that solid rock to about uh, three meters is using a rock pulverizer. And it does a great job of just blasting a hole 10 feet deep. Yeah, why don't you just go ahead and show that video uh, real quick then, since we got yeah. you sharing the screen. You may have to change what I'm sharing. Let's see, can you guys see a YouTube video or do you see, yes. still see my slides? Okay. The YouTube. Oh, there we go, maybe. Is this a time lapse, I think? Oh. I you can you see that, comment? yeah, you can, it's, a, it's a rotary mechanism with a pneumatic attachment. Uh, what it does is it turns slightly and vibrates, pulverizing the rock, and then it blasts air out the bottom to get the, the debris out. Uh, it makes quick work of it, but you, we didn't do it in 2017 because of the facilities required. It takes a big air compressor uh, to get that much volume through it. It takes a small excavator. It's not a big deal with the excavator, but the, the, the pneumatic air compressor uh, was a little bit beyond our budget, I think. Uh, so we ended up using a hydraulic auger to drill. But if I had my, my weathers, I would get that pneumatic uh, uh, pulverizer every time. But not all locations. I mean, I showed some of our sites photos uh, are, we can't always get big equipment like that up to that's right. the site. Yep. Um, that's all I had. So I'll stop sharing and then maybe. Okay, yeah. We have one quick question uh, for you, Renata, mm -hmm. um, uh, about your PVC vaults and if they were dry, i.e. watertight. Yes. Carl, you wanna uh, explain how, how they get sealed up? So the, uh, if you could go to the drawing, Renata, I think uh, the drawing of the, this, the vault. Is, uh, one uh, there. This one here. The one right, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, that one on the south there's, level. There's an actual drawing of it. On one oh, the slide. drawing. Okay. This one. There we go. The drawing is that right one there. It's, uh, so we uh, we do keep it uh, ice, you know, electric. Well, I don't want any water in there because I don't want any electrical seepage into the ground. In the Pacific Northwest, we basically have a electrical conductor year round called the soil, um, and I don't want electrical uh, penetration through it in any way, shape, or form. So it is sealed. It's watertight. The the conduit leaving the vault going to the swing set goes up into the enclosure and above. Uh, any potential water level. So no water gets in there. Uh, the idea is, is if water did get in there, it's not that big a deal. It's Cascadia, it's meant for direct burial. We drill a 12 inch uh, hole and often drilling down is difficult and you get off kelter. And so we do, do drill a 12 inch hole to put an eight inch PVC to put a four inch instrument in there. And by doing that, you allow for the errors of tilt when you're drilling. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that answered the question or not. <laughs> yeah, I th think that's great. And then just one last question on the uh, rock pulverizer auger. Is it a tricone drill bit? Uh, you know, I don't know. I looked for that for a while and there were a few definitions for it. It might be. Okay, we'll leave that one open. Um, okay, so I had, um, we've got a lot of questions, we're not going to get to all of them. And part of this is, of course, um, going to be uh, addressed in the discussions with with uh, far more people. Obviously, there's all of these projects have have had many, many people involved in them, um, not just who you're seeing in, in front of you right now. And so, uh, so we really are looking forward to having some of these um, technical discussions over the spring. Um, in order to really get into this kind of nitty gritty detail. Um, so to bring us back to um, a bigger view though, um, because all of us here are um, seismologists um, on your screen, <laughs> are seismologists as well as um, knowing uh, a lot about the network operations and everything. 
Um, how do you, um, each of you, um, in your own ways and your own um, uh, desires, how do you balance having more stations or stations in um, a wider area um, versus better stations? You know, there's been a lot of talk about what things cost and um, and and the cost of maintaining a network is certainly not um, insignificant. And so, how do you go about that when you're also focused on the research side of, um, you know, trying to uh, detect smaller earthquakes or um, get more detail from from those recordings? I, guess I can hop in. Um, I guess one thing that for me, it's like as a researcher, this is where writing grants and doing temporary deployments is critical. Um, so if you want to actually answer research questions, you have to start looking at temporary deployments. Because one of the challenges that people don't talk about when they talk about network operations, so it's not just putting the seismometer in the ground, it's getting that data from the seismometer to the network in real time. And that is usually the most limiting factor is the communications network. It's not necessarily, oh, we have a site, a landowner, that will give us security, great but there's no way to get that data to the network. So the consideration for real time is always not only the site, but also the communications. Um, and that can be a great challenge because satellite communications is very expensive. And so even at PRSM with the upgrades, not all of our stations are satellite based now um, because we just it's a straight out cost issue. Um, and the other thing you have to think about is logistics. Um, this is a challenge that's probably unique to Puerto Rico and other ocean islands, is that we don't have just the main island of Puerto Rico. We have stations on Vieques, in Culebra, Mona, Mona Island, Casa de Muertos, the Virgin Islands. And all of those are costs for travel, which right now in COVID times is very difficult. <laughs> I'd like to add a little bit into, it's like not all our sites are six component sites with, that include a broadband and, a, and an accelerometer. But like, I know you're all probably aware that we're building out for the earthquake early warning system. And that involves a lot of just strong motion sites as well, where uh, it's a lot less involved. Um, and so, so those are definitely cheaper to install. Um, yeah, so for our real purpose for these, like, six channel sites, it's really just the longevity of them and the maintainability. Like it needs to be able to be maintained easily over tens of years. And like Elizabeth, uh, Liz said, um, the telemetry, how to get the data out is very important. Like I showed like one site, you know, why do we sometimes perch our sites on the side of a hill? <laughs> why is that necessary? So that helps in getting the signal out. Um, if we can shoot the signal from one place to another. So that's for, the, for that, usually for that reason. I think I would add there's an operational component to this, right? So for the regional network, you know, having a magnitude of completeness of one and a half to two over our response area is, is appropriate. And for standards, we don't even have to go that low. So that will sort of dictate how the network is built out and you want in areas that have more seismicity, you might have a, you know, a closer station or something to improve your monitoring. Whereas the experiment I showed for Forge, right, has a very different goal, right? We have to monitor to magnitude zero completeness and for reservoir development down to, to minus two. So in terms of choosing your instrumentation and balancing costs and all of these things. I think it's at some level, you have to look at sort of what, what the goal of whatever that pot of money is that's funding that particular network. And so I think for us, that's, that's a big role. And, and even in choosing how to upgrade stations going forward in the, with the, the regional network is, you know, reassessing what stations add the most value and which ones will provide where we really have to have a quiet station or a six component station versus a three component station. I think it's really looking at what our, our objectives are.
Yeah, that, that's yeah. The, of course, there's going to be a lot of um, factors at play, and and I know um, the limitation is generally funding, but also some feasibility as well, <laughs> um, in especially in these remote areas. Emily, did you have a comment on? on um, I I think our panelists pretty much summed it up uh, very well. You know, like you can. We we know what makes a good site, but sometimes you just have to put a seismometer somewhere for other constraints, right? For telemetry or because you're trying to achieve a certain geometry with your array, like transportable array stations, for example, right? There's not an outcrop within a hundred kilometers of many of those sites. And so even if even if rock is better, we just know we we need a station there and we can't get rock. So we're putting it here to fulfill other scientific objectives and we accept that trade-off. Um, so yeah, I think defining the the goal, like what are you hoping to achieve with this post, with your post hole emplacement or, or any installation is, is key. So helping make kind of like, yeah, figuring out what best practices are going to be for your application. Absolutely. All right, we'll dig into a couple more questions. I think we'll probably wrap up a little bit early just um, for everyone's sake. Um, <laughs> but um, before we get into too many of the weeds, because we want to save some of those discussions for later too. Um, but I'll um, uh, start out this one uh, from uh, Marino Proti. Does cementing the casing in the bottom of the hole bring the high frequency surface noise down more effectively uh, for the sensor? And I'd like to go ahead and um, answer this just from the Alaska TA perspective. Um, that we did um, uh, spend quite a lot of effort in in grouting um, through the bottom of the casing uh, and sending the grout out um, in order to um, cement the casing really nicely and tightly into the surrounding ground conditions. And we do believe that that was um, one of the main driving factors of why the performance is so good at those um, post holes, because those post holes um, were only um, you know, one to two meters in depth. So they aren't, aren't gigantic um, <laughs> post holes. And, um, and, but we are seeing some really um, high performance out of them. And so that extra time, I mean, it does take time on site. I know I, I actually got to go out to some of those and, and getting all the components together and your grout pump is, it does take effort and it's in a remote environment, but uh, we, we do believe that that had a main um, impact on, on the performance for those stations. Um, I don't know if um, others wanted to comment on that question. Feel free to chime in. Not directly related, but sort of related. There are some questions about the aluminum uh, oxide grid that we put around the sensor. And I was going to oh, ask Carl if he can ask, uh, answer why you chose that particular material. It, uh, can you hear me? Am I on? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, non reactive and uh, nanometrics. Uh, um, said that was what the media that they wanted us to use. Uh, we reviewed a few of them and that, uh, and we finally went back to nanometrics and they said that would be best. So far it's be it has worked well. It's very dense. Um, pouring it in there is a bit of a, uh, a procedure. If you do it right, it only takes about 10 minutes. If you do it wrong, it's gonna take about four hours because you gotta pull it all out, but uh, works well. Great, and that yeah, I think, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, um, but as we were putting our, our heads together yesterday, Casey and I, this was one of the things that came up and there, there's been testing and previous experience with things like sand or glass beads, um, and which people have unfortunately found the hard way tend to lock a, or cement a sensor in place. Um, so the, the aluminum oxide um, is, is sort of a good option that's commonly used, um, for example, in you know, GSN boreholes and things like that. And you and you can get it anywhere and uh, it's readily available. Yeah, and materials will definitely be something. I know that there's a lot of questions about like casing materials, fill materials, grouting materials and all of that. I think it th those are definitely going to be questions that we'll um, hopefully discuss in more detail in the, in the later discussions. Um, but I've got one question here. Um, 
from Chris Hayward, um, when do folks put the electronics in the post hole as well as the sensor? What is the benefit or problems associated with, with that, putting electronics with the sensor? I would lean toward getting the electronics up out of the ground, at least at sites that you know tend to be in wetter areas. Um, because if you like some some of those photos I showed at a flooded vaults, you know if you um, if your Q three thirty goes for a swim, it also does not enjoy getting wet. So um, the kind of the post hole model I'm imagining is that you have just the sensor in that hole, and then probably a separate box above ground for your batteries, electronics, communications equipment. That's what we do. Yeah, we have it completely separate. Yeah, it's the same at PRSN. I think part of that is you have to think about long-term maintenance for especially for regional networks. And usually things that go are things like communications, not the actual seismometer. So having easy access to that is quite important. Yeah, the one downside I could see is that, you know, for in, in like a TA style vault, all of your, you know, when you have the batteries and the um, digitizer also buried, maybe that deters people from messing with it. Um, if you put stuff above ground, it's easier to access for your field engineers, but it's also easier to access for curious folks who are walking by. Um, but yeah, there's, I think the, the trade-off of keeping it out of the water in a lot of cases makes a lot of sense. All right, I've got a question here from Josh Stachnik. Going back to the question by Gary Pavlis and thinking about these installations from a theoretical and engineering standpoint, are there thoughts on engaging maybe the civil engineering community, either academic or industry? Maybe we to answer, I, I guess I, I should ask to answer what question. Um, it's my question back. <laughs> I mean, it, it would, this is Carl again, it would be nice to have a case study with the side by side comparisons with all our options that costs a lot of money and time. And uh, right now, as far as I know, none of us have done it. So uh, it's still a little bit of a mystery between grout, no grout, electrical isolation, steel casing, uh, the depth. We don't know the answers to that. We're, we're all uh, kind of guessing a little bit. That's why we're here, right? And we should note too, though, that there are actually a couple um, different side-by-side um, -side studies. I know um, at Pinion Flat and also at ASL um, that have been done. And there are there is documentation. It may not um, be widely known, but that is one of the goals here is to get that um, information compiled and in a format that is accessible to everyone, um, as well as it would be great, of course, to do more studies too. But um, we all are limited on time and budget, so. Exactly, and you know, future events in the series, we're, we're hoping to line up people from who have worked at Pinion Flat and front and at ASL, because we, goodness knows, we have plenty of boreholes and post holes out there. Um, so we'll, we'll get to hear more about those in detail, um, you know, trying to, to isolate specific um, variables and installation types that um, seem to operate better. Yeah, no. Fun. Okay. I just wanted to hop in. It's like I think one thing that probably long term needs to be looked at and would take the community is looking at these different environments. Because obviously, Ocean Island is going to be very different than the Pacific Northwest and very different from the desert. So they might actually require different standards based on the environment. But that, again, is something we don't know yet because it hasn't been studied in detail. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll add a comment here from Gary Pavlis about um, this as well, that um, we could also learn from soil scientists um, to better understand the rheology of those near surface materials and how they affect our measurements too. So yeah, maybe we'll be inviting a few more people to these technical discussions um, outside of our field as well. Um, I'll add one more question here. Um, uh, from Timothy Bartholomew, uh, we've seen that site noise can be just as significant as installation noise or sensor noise. And so sometimes one can spend a lot of money to get deeper without much benefit in noise performance. Do you have any methods to assess in advance whether a noisy site is the result of the installation procedure, the sensor, or the site's intrinsic noise level? 
Well, so I'll, I can jump on this one. That This is a, a question where I think it's very important to specify what frequency band you're talking about when you're asking about noise, right? because the things that produce cultural noise are going to be very different from the things that produce long period tilt um, and things like that. Um, but one, one very easy way to do this is to do um, to, to take a portable kind of instrument and run it on the surface for a day or you know a time span that you think will kind of characterize if you're looking at high frequency noise the the range of activity you're expecting to see at that site um, and then you can you know sort of guess that the deeper you go the farther away you'll get from that but just a, a, a quick site survey is something that I, I've seen um, regional net networks use to you know choose a site and see if it's going to be suitable for their needs. Yeah, there are also if you if you really want to get into it, um, like for transportable array sighting, I did this as a graduate student. And based on that table of criteria that I showed, um, they actually gave us uh, maps that they had, um, had a GIS analyst draw a buffer around typical noise sources like railroads and highways. And so those, you know, within 10 kilometers of a railroad colored red and you, you can actually look for spots that are far away from these sources that we know to be noisy. So that's um, another way to do it is if you're driving around, look at Google Earth, see what noise their sources are close to your desired site. Yeah, that's what I've also done a very rough thing where our ciders might bring a portable uh, 30 second seismometer out to temporarily record some local signals, just let it sit for a while. Uh, of course, that's a very rough indication of just overall noisiness in the higher frequency band. But it's, it's, uh, this is yeah. Carl. Usually we're so constrained. I mean, we're running away from solar panels and antenna masts, but then we, we go 20 feet and we run into the next tree. Uh, we can't exactly uh, run from everything when we're siting. I just want to point that out in the Pacific Northwest and the railways and geez, we're putting in so many sites, we, we just kind of, the siters just kind of run out of options and, uh, and who will host us. So uh, I don't know, it's not a lot you can do. I just want to add, especially in the regional networks is like things like security are sometimes like quite important. So I know PRSN, even though we have all of our traditional vaults, they have locks, we still try to put it on sites where there's always a landowner or there's security. And that's quite important as well. And sometimes you just don't have a choice. Um, or in one case, we have one station PRSN, that's, one of those, that's a station that's hardlined as a backup into our network. So if all else fails, we at least have some data coming in to see if there's a big event. Um, because there's always for us the tsunami as well. All right, in the interest of time, um, if there's any final comments uh, that are on the panelists' minds that they want to say before we wrap up, please go ahead. Well, I just want to, because I think this is a great thing that you're doing, um, just want to start out with that. And this is a good idea to get the community together to talk talking about these best practices. And one thing I've noticed that we are just touching on the quantitative side of doing these analysis from the seismology community. And I think that's maybe one thing that maybe we can have as one of the end goals from the seismologists is start looking at the postal sites we do have and do some comparative quantitative analysis and talk about what sites worked, what sites didn't. And I, that might provide insight for future sites um, because I know post tolls can be quite expensive or not possible given if you're trying to drill into something like basalt, it's very expensive. <laughs> well, it sounds like there is some, some quantitative work that's been done. I'd like to know where to access that information. It, and this, this is the goal of kind of hearing from a bunch of folks, and that's that's that database that we want to assemble is because in order to look at this in a systematic way, we need to, we all need to be able to know when a site was upgraded, for example, right? I mean, you can kind of, if you know what you're looking for, you can see it in the metadata, um, but having a, a, you know, site before this was a vault, site after this was a, broad, was a post hole, and here's all the details. This is exactly the kind of analysis that we're hoping to facilitate by assembling um, a database that's available to the community with this kind of information in it. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's been a lot of work and we, we should definitely emphasize this, that there has been a lot of work that we will, will uh, be incorporating to into our um, our best practices that we develop. And a lot of people out there in the audience who are attendees right now that, that have a lot to say that we are eager to listen to. So, um, so this is just the beginning. Um, but with that, I think I'll go ahead and conclude unless there's any final thoughts, last chance. Yeah, thanks so much to all of our panelists who agreed to be here today. It's been really awesome hearing from you and to our audience members, thank you for the questions. Um, and yeah, we're, we're looking forward to hearing from a lot more folks and, and digging even deeper into this in the future. So thanks everybody. Yeah, I'll also say yeah, thank you um, for joining us on this webinar to our audience and the panel discussion to the panelists. Um, uh, the recording of this event will be made available as soon as possible. If you are interested in presenting at or attending the future technical discussions on this topic or um, our more detailed topics, please get in touch with us, uh, that'd be Emily and, and me, um, and more information will be posted on that website. Uh, we look forward to your participation. So thank you again.